thing is the basics of the grassroots of gray suit. Well, we have uh, a lot of feature changes. In fact, uh, so many that I can't list them all. There's uh, up to a couple of hundred feature changes in the sedans alone. Motoring 93 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, your under-the-car specialists for imports and domestics. One of the new marketing tools used by car manufacturers is something called the Roadside Assistant Program. Hello everybody and welcome to Motoring 93. Now this program says that if you have any problem with your vehicle, the manufacturer, after calling a 1-800 number, will send someone to assist you. Well, I'm roadside and I've got a problem. I'm driving a brand new 1993 Nissan Quest. It's a great car. In fact, on an earlier test drive, Graham Fletcher gave it full marks, but I do have a problem. The heating gauge is showing me that I am overheating. It is right over on the H. So I've pulled alongside the road here. I have phoned the Nissan 1-800 number. Now we'll wait and see if this program really works. And while we're waiting, let's join Paul Culleton, who has a story about a popular racing program that has produced many of this country's leading car drivers. Two of the hottest drivers on the IndyCar circuit are Canadians, Paul Tracy and Scott Goodyear. Both, along with other greats like Jill Villeneuve, began their careers behind the wheel of a go-kart. Karting is the basics of the grassroots of racing. Um, a lot of people start here at the age of seven. They go right up. The oldest one that we've had here is 65 years old. Actually, karting has been around for years, probably since the 60s, maybe even a little before that. Um, competitiveness is actually what you make it. You come out, maybe your first season, um, you end up doing a lot of circles, just trying to learn the lines, follow other drivers. You find that once you start to be competitive with other drivers, you may win a first race, all of a sudden it becomes very, very competitive. Uh, there was a vintage race down in Shannonville and they had go-karts there also and uh, we met some people and they invite us, invited us up to watch a race and we just kept on coming and coming and then we saw a go-kart for sale so we bought it and just jumped right into it I guess. I think everybody's dream is to become an Indy car driver or a stock car driver. Both Paul Tracy and Scott Goodyear raced here at this track and uh, we've met them and talked to them before and yeah they're Really neat. <laughs> Five, 94, six, oh, mine's junior four-stroke, and it's a Honda engine, five-horse, and there's about 12, 15 go-karters go all around the same age, like under 16, and uh, it's pretty good class. They're not they're not the fastest class out there, but they're really a good class for smoothness because they they're less in horsepower, so you have to be a lot smoother, and they're uh, more precise, I guess you could say. What do your parents think of you doing this? Oh, they love it. <laughs> they, yeah. yeah, my dad's a real motorsports nut, so he just enjoys this. He thinks it's better than any other sport, so. What about your mom? Does she ever worry about you getting hurt? Uh, she worries a bit, yeah. She yeah. shakes. <laughs> what do you say to her? Oh, I just tell her to relax. That's about it. <laughs> I'm 10 years old, uh -huh. and I got started because I used to always drive by here. Uh -huh. And I, I, I always wanted to do it, so one day me and my dad came up here uh -huh. and, we, and we went one of those go-karts down here and I kept on doing it and doing it. So my dad bought me one go-kart of my own and I practiced for a year, then I started racing. So you guys are buddies? Yeah, we're like in the same class. Oh yeah? So do you race against each other? Yeah, we were, we're in the same age group, we race against each other. Yeah. So who's the better driver? Uh, we're equal. Just so everybody knows, my name is Bruce Fowler. I'm the president of the club here. Today's event, we're going to basically have a, two qualifying heats, two eight-lap qualifying heats, okay? The way you signed up uh, on your registration is basically how we're splitting the classes down the middle. Please, we have the uh, ambulance attendants and we have everybody. Let's not use them. Okay, people? You have a good race, and lots of luck.
My boyfriend introduced me to the sport and I found it always interesting because having a father involved in cars, collecting antique cars and whatnot, and having no brothers, there's always been exposure to it. And my boyfriend Danny was interested in it and decided, hey, why don't you give it a shot? And I did. I tried his cart to begin with and that's how I really started out doing it and then ended up buying my own. Uh, in the club, the Durham Cart Club, we don't have men and women's divisions. Um, and really that's fair in my opinion because we all weigh the same. There is no difference between a man and a woman in this sport. Um, if you're starting out in a sport like this, you can get involved for, you know, the lowest cost, maybe around $400, you can pick up a cart. Um, and you can go all the way up from there. I mean, you really can go into the thousand dollar ranks if you're looking at doing that. Um, but if you're starting out, you really don't have to spend a whole lot of money. It's one of the grassroots forms of racing and one of the most inexpensive, I think. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. The subject of this week's test drive happens to be one of our long-term testers. Now this is the 1993 Subaru Legacy Wagon, a wagon that is best described as one being designed for all seasons. Supertramp sang the logical song. In the car world, Subaru sing the equivalent. The new Legacy Touring Wagon puts the very latest technology into a very versatile vehicle that handles and drives as nicely as the Legacy sedan we tested a while ago. As a package, the Touring Wagon comes in one format only, and that is loaded. You will find a full complement of power options right down to, or should I say up to, the moonroof. A nice touch is the express up and down feature for the left side window. From the driver's perspective, the instrumentation is comprehensive, logically laid out, and easy to interpret. The only item I would have liked to have seen is a boost gauge for the turbo. The seats are a bit on the hard side, but nonetheless provide the required level of support and comfort. The driver's seat is height adjustable and has an adjustable lumbar support. On the safety front, a driver's side airbag and adjustable upper seat belt anchors are in place, along with three-point seat belts for the rear outboard passengers. The Legacy offers split folding rear seat, a nice flat floor, and a privacy cover to keep prying eyes off your junk. The tailgate is also cut to bumper level, meaning there's no annoying lip. Under the hood is a 2.2-litre 16-valve fuel-injected flat-4 boxer engine that comes equipped with a turbocharger. Power is rated at 160 horses and 181 pounds-feet of torque. What makes this power plant work is the fact that the turbo produces maximum boost at a leisurely 1,750 RPM, and this effectively eliminates turbo lag. On the skid pad, the wagon required just over 8 seconds to reach the 100k mark. As respectable as that may be, it is the 80 to 120k acceleration that makes you sit up and take note. By way of interest, this engine works exceptionally well with the standard 4-speed automatic transmission. Under normal circumstances, you derive the best from any engine when it's coupled with a manual transmission. During the test, we recorded an average fuel economy of 26 miles per gallon or 10.9 litres per 100 kilometres. As this is one of our long-term testers, we will have more information on this when we wrap that test up. One of the problems manufacturers who put turbos on their engines face is keeping the turbocharger itself cool. On this Subaru, they've accomplished that doing two things. First of all, they use engine coolant to keep the bearing housing relatively cool, and then they use an air intake on the hood to direct air around the casing. Now this helps dissipate the heat buildup from that area. The other important thing to remember about turbochargers is that once they've been spun up to speed, which is about 160,000 RPM, it takes a fair while for them to spool down to rest. Now if you've just come off the highway and park your car in the driveway, that turbo is still spinning at a great rate of knots. If you turn the engine off, you've deprived the bearings of a decent oil supply. Next time you undergo that sort of circumstance, make sure you leave the engine to idle for about a minute. That way, that gives the turbocharger time to spool down. By doing that, you'll not only save yourself a lot of money in the long run, you'll add a lot of life and pleasure to the driving of a turbocharged car.
Anti-lock brakes are becoming so common on today's cars that there is little to say about them when you find them on a car. However, when you combine them with a full-time four-wheel drive system, you have a setup that's worthy of comment. The four-wheel drive system ensures that the power is put to the pavement in an efficient manner regardless of weather conditions, and the ABS makes sure you can stop in an equally efficient manner. In short, a wonderful combination that ensures a stable, sure-footed ride. For the record, the Legacy required 114 feet to stop from 80k. In the pylon test, the touring wagon fared better than the average wagon. While you'll find little in the way of high-tech gadgetry in the suspension design, it accomplishes the task at hand in a confident manner. There is little in the way of body roll and out on the open road it absorbs most bumps in stride. The other thing that impressed me during the test was the fact that the four-wheel drive system remains unobtrusive. Some vehicles suffer from wind-up under these conditions, which transmits an annoying vibration to the driver. Off the top, I mentioned this was a car for all seasons. Now, I say that primarily because of the full-time four-wheel drive and ABS. When you add to that a very comfortable, compliant suspension system that gives the car a very confident feel, and you have one that can handle just about anything Mother Nature can throw at it. The Subaru Legacy Wagon is proof positive that a car doesn't have to cost a fortune to be technically superior. I mean, look at the full-time four-wheel drive, anti-lock brakes, all combined in the versatility and stability of a nice wagon. Now, that concludes the road test on this vehicle. However, we will be back in future programs with updates because it's one of our long-term testers. Well, we're still out here alongside the highway. As I mentioned earlier at the top of the program, we have some overheating problems with our vehicle, and we're taking this opportunity to see if these new road assistant programs really work. Now, we phoned Nissan only 20 minutes ago, so there's still no panic. Uh, so while we're waiting, why don't we head to the garage and join a man who never panics, and that is Bill Gardner. You know, like a lot of other mechanical items on your vehicle, the transmission is something you don't tend to think too much about until there's actually a symptom of a problem. And in many cases, that might just be too late to save it. You may have already done some damage. So make sure that one of the things you check periodically is the fluid level and condition in the transmission. Now, if it's an automatic like this minivan, that's a pretty easy deal because the, the dipstick extends right up under the hood here. And that's, in fact, the place that we have to add the fluid as well. It's a little bit different deal than adding engine oil. With the transmission, you have to put it right down that, that uh, dipstick tube with a gooseneck funnel, something like this. Now, uh, marked on the dipstick, as well as the add and, and full levels, is some important information. For example, this one tells you to check it when it's hot. The transmission must be in park and the vehicle has to be level. And it tells you the type of fluid to use, which in this case is Dexron 2 fluid. Now, we're going to put this vehicle up on the hoist and have a look at how you'd go about doing some preventive maintenance or fluid changing and filter changing on an automatic. And we want to talk a little bit about standard transmissions because they're somewhat different. You can't, in most cases, you can't check them from under the hood here. You have to hoist the vehicle up and get underneath, remove a little pipe plug and stick your pinky in the side of the transmission there to, uh, to, to check that fluid level and condition. So that's a little bit more work. Now, just like the engine oil and oil filter, the transmission its fluid and its filter need to be changed periodically. Now, if we were talking about the engine oil, we'd be up here, we'd have a drain bolt, and there's our filter for the engine oil, both readily accessible, making it very easy to change those items. But when we look back at the transmission, it's a whole different deal. We don't have a drain bolt in most cases, and the filter is hidden inside the transmission. So it's a bit of a messy deal to, to service this item. We have to take out all the perimeter bolts around this uh, transmission pan and remove the pan and that means that four or five liters of fluid come sloshing over the edge of the pan all the way around the outside. It's very difficult to catch and it tends to be a very messy operation but it's a necessary operation. Inside the transmission we've got a filter that looks very much like that. It's a throwaway deal. You can see the filter media right here. We can't get in there to service it or wash it so we'll throw this unit away and install a new one when we're doing that type of servicing. There's the pickup tube that, that sticks into the transmission. There's usually a clip to secure this, uh, this filter at the back. Now, the filter rests almost right on the bottom of the transmission pan, so it picks up 
all the uh, fluid in the transmission. And in the bottom of that pan, we'll tend to get a lot of sediment and debris, filings, et cetera. And that's something that needs to be washed out periodically when the fluid's changed. Now, we'll also need a pan gasket when we take that, that cover off, that transmission pan. We'll have to replace the gasket. It's a deal something like this. And it tends to fatigue or dry out and crack and leak over a period of time. So it, it should be changed periodically. Now, a, a, a manual transmission is a little bit different deal for servicing. Uh, we've got one over on the bench, and we want to show you just how easy it is to uh, check the level and uh, drain and replace fluid on that unit. It's much simpler. Okay, what we've got here is a five-speed manual transmission we've actually removed from a vehicle. Now, if this thing was in the vehicle, it wouldn't be quite as easy to get at these uh, inspection plugs and the drain plug. Uh, we'd have the transmission tunnel somewhere in around here, so we'd have to sort of reach up in here. And what we do is we just take an open end wrench and remove these pipe plugs. This upper one is where we fill it and check the fluid level. And what you do is just stick your small finger in there and turn it downwards and feel for that fluid level. Now I've drained most of the fluid out of this transmission so I can't get anything there. But in most cases, you'd find that the fluid level should be roughly up to there. Now you can also see that the transmission's a little bit oily and grimy. They all leak a little bit, so it, it is something that has to be checked and topped up periodically. Or, as I mentioned before, if you see a fluid leak underneath, check it right away. Now at the bottom of the transmission case, we've got another pipe plug right here. And this is the one that you remove to drain the oil or drain the fluid out of the transmission. Now this one uses automatic transmission fluid but you'd want to check with your owner's manual to see the approved fluid and it needs to be changed periodically and with the with the manual transmission you've always got a drain plug like this so it's an easy deal to change now consult your owner's manual and see what type of fluid is used uh, in some cases it's gear oil something like this or it may be automatic transmission fluid or in some cases even uh, 10w30 or 10w40 engine oil is called for check it and make sure that you're adding or, or refilling it with the appropriate fluid. Another key tip uh, that you may want to get into is, is uh, this time of year, change the fluid in that, in that manual transmission to a synthetic uh, lubricant. Tremendous gain in cold weather performance, easier shifting, and much, much better fuel economy. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 93. Detroit, Motor City, home of the Big Three. Hardly the place for a British classic car maker to introduce a new model, right? Wrong. In fact, if the company is Jaguar, then Detroit makes sense. Back in 1989, Ford purchased the struggling Jaguar, and Ford has pumped in large amounts of cash since then. But Jaguar continues to lose money. Jaguar sales peaked in 1987, with 2,600 cars sold in Canada. But sales have dropped steadily, and Jaguar will sell only 600 in 1992. Despite poor sales, Jaguar is optimistic about the future and its relationship with Ford. Well, they came in in 1989, and uh, the industry has been in considerable recession at that time and since then. Our markets in uh, Europe uh, are also in recession and in North America and in Japan, so they're tough days. But uh, with an investor like Ford in, at the wheel of the company now, uh, with the kind of resources that they can provide, we can put enough into our engineering, manufacturing and marketing uh, that uh, I think we can vindicate Ford's decision to buy us, which obviously was a well thought out decision. Uh, all of the things that we're experiencing right now are a little bit of turbulence at the beginning of the flight path. Uh, but from here on out, uh, we are entirely confident that uh, we can do a good job for them. We've uh, uh, realigned the model range somewhat. Uh, we'll have two sedans, uh, the XJ6 Sovereign and the XJ6 Vandom Plow. One significant change for Jaguar is the elimination of the V12 in the XJS, replacing it with the 223 horsepower 4-liter inline-six. 
Well, the V12 uh, sales have uh, suffered a little bit um, against the background of energy conservation and people's concerns about energy and in Ontario the fuel consumption tax. Um, the V12 is less of an attractive proposition, uh, we feel, for the Canadian buyer. So for the time being we're taking the V12s out of the range and we're going to take a look at its future further down the road. The Infiniti G20, Subaru Legacy Touring Wagon, and Mazda MX-6 Mystia, all members of our long-term test fleet. It's time to update the Mystia. So far we've had one minor glitch with the Mystia. The low pressure return hose for the power steering melted on the EGR pipe. It looked as though it had been misrouted quite badly during the assembly process. A quick call to the dealer and about one hour later everything was hunky-dory again. Fuel economy is running around the 27 mile per gallon mark, which for a car that you tend to drive with a lead boot is much better than expected. In our next update we will have details on the costs associated with following Mazda's maintenance schedule. Our Midas tip of the week concerns radiator and cooling system hoses rad hoses and heater hoses. Now you can see that they're rubber hoses and on the end cut here you can see the ends of the fiber or fabric that reinforces those hoses and gives them strength. Now these hoses will have to be changed periodically. A good rule of thumb is about every four years. But as you can see they're molded into some pretty uh, unique shapes and you can't take a, a, a standard or bulk piece of hose and bend it into a 90 degree bend like that without it collapsing. So in many cases it's a specialized hose to fit that application good idea to carry spares in your trunk. Not a hard deal to change, but if you don't have them, you're out of luck. That's our Midas tip of the week. Chevrolet Cavalier, the number one selling car in this country. Can anybody tell me why? I'll be back in a moment in Kenzie's Corner. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. You know, I probably shouldn't be insulting a car that a lot of you viewers probably own, but I've always had a problem with the Chevy Cavalier. You know, it's not a bad looking car, particularly in the two-door coupe version. With the V6 engine, the performance isn't so bad, and it is the lowest priced car in Canada that has anti-lock brakes as standard equipment. But the suspension is horrible, and the seats are horrible, and the structure is horrible, and the dashboard is horrible. Come on, General Motors, you can do better than this. Now GM says, hey, it's the number one selling car in the country. We must be doing something right. Yes, but not one of those 50,000 people who bought that car this year would refuse to buy it if it were better. 10 cents more in the suspension bushings and 20 cents more in a structure, they have a much better car. I don't think the customers are going to say, oh, geez, if the suspension were smoother, I'm not sure I'd like it. Or if, if the body were stiffer, it, it wouldn't develop all those squeaks and rattles. No, 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 I'll stay with my Cavalier. Come on, you guys. Quit building cars to meet your minimum customer's expectations and build cars that are better than they expect. You've proven with the Saturn at the bottom end and the Seville at the top end that you can do better. So let's aim a little bit higher next time. You'll have customers for life. I'm Jim Kenzie. Well, if you've recently purchased a car that comes with the road assistant warranty, I'm happy to report that it certainly seems to work. As we mentioned off the top of the program, we indeed had some overheating problems with our Nissan Quest. Now, the engine has cooled down and we've determined it's nothing more than a low water level on our radiator. But what is impressive is that 25 minutes after I made the phone call to Nissan in this case, the tow truck was here with the water problem solved. So, it's a good marketing tool for car manufacturers and in this instance, it certainly seems to work for you, the consumer. That's it for now. We'll see you next week for more stories about cars and the people who drive them. Motoring 93 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, your under-the-car specialists for imports and domestics. <laughs>